Hello, everyone. Welcome to Virtual VSC. My name is Kristen Mills. I am your host for this evening. Uh, I am the Visual Arts Program Manager here at Vermont Studio Center. And okay, let's see. Now to Wendy White. Wendy White Solo Museum exhibition entitled Low Pressure opened at Museum, I'm not sure I pronounce this, Gosh, Gotch, Gotch? Gok. 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 But you can say hello. Gok. Okay, it's in Germany and it's up right now. Mm -hmm. um, it opened last month and it's up a little bit longer. September or something. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> um, she also had a solo exhibition at Denny Dimon Gallery uh, and that was just in the spring, May through July and that's in New York. Um, she said institutional group exhibitions uh, such as Expedition at the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center, uh, Globe as a Palette at the Contemporary Art from the Taguchi Collection, and that was in Japan in 2019, uh, American Idol at SCAD Museum of Art in Savannah, Georgia, 2018, um, and many, many, many more. Our solo exhibitions are, include the Kai Kai Kiki in Tokyo, uh, Leo Koenig in New York. Uh, let's see, what else do we got? We've got uh, Andrew Rafaz Gallery in Chicago and a million more. You can go to her website, you can find all this stuff out. But what she is, is she's with us right now. So you can ask her any question you want. Uh, Wendy is a recipient of a painting fellowship from the New York Foundation for the Arts. That was in 2012 and a George Segal painting grant in 2018. Her work was featured in Vaden's anthology, Vitamin P2, New Perspectives in Painting in 2011. Uh, she lives and works in New York City, although she's in Florida right now. Uh, she holds a BFA from Savannah College and an MFA from Rutgers University. I am going to spotlight Wendy's right now, personally, her, spotlight her and her work. So that is, I believe, what you will see as well. And uh, Wendy, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Well, that was... Great, thank you so much for the invitation and for um, thanks to everybody who's here on a Monday night. Um, I'm gonna do a little like abridged version um, and keep it kind of, I mean, not super short, but short and sweet and engaging hopefully. And, um, and I'll be ready for your questions at the end or whenever. So um, something that I, have really worked hard. This is like, I'm gonna start with my overarching philosophy for my quote unquote career, which I hate the word career because for artists, it's not a job per se. Um, it's something, it's a lifestyle. It's something that you devote your entire life to. So I hate to use those words, but something that I've really worked hard to do is to create a space within which I can make really radical changes in my work. Um, and still be able to participate in the art world at large. That wasn't so easy at the beginning. Um, people don't really want you to make radical changes in your work, um, but it's something that's important to me and I try to maintain this momentum of um, not quite being unfiltered, but always letting new things into my work constantly. So I work in series that are uh, mostly ongoing. And what, this, what happens with my series where they kind of I kind of snowball um, moves from previous series and keep working with things that I've worked. I think everyone kind of does this to an extent, but I will throw in like a radical new material or work with um, new content. And if the work looks different or needs to look different, I allow it to. Um, maybe that doesn't sound revolutionary, but for, for me, it, it has been something that I've had to carve out very carefully. So, um, that said, there are common threads that run through all of my series. And for example, from the beginning, I've used a lot of black. Um, and there's always in every series, the juxtaposition of the handmade and the graphic. That's always in everything that I make. That's kind of where my, the, the friction lies in my work and also the friction between painting and sculpture. This is a painting from 2007 called Auto Kennel. In the 17 years since I made this painting, I have made a lot of work that incorporates uh, formal aspects of it such as multiple canvas, sculptural appendages, irregular edges, um, and things have branched, other series have branched off from it conceptually as well. Um, this piece was largely about sports and action on the field, as if the field is pictorial space. Um, and so these conceptual threads kind of keep pushing forward and I'll hopefully explain that in a way that makes some sense. 
if I can get my slide to advance. Okay, so I studied fibers in undergrad. Then I took eight years off. This is where the weirdness comes in. This is why I don't, I'm not a reverent painter per se. I took eight years off. During those eight years, I started painting on my own. I had only taken one painting class, intro to oil painting in undergrad. I hated it. I've always hated oils. Um, I went to grad school for painting after an eight year break. So I was already adulterated by materials and other um, like sculptural sort of ideas. Um, I had a really liberal idea of what painting could be or should be. In fibers, it was all about the inherent content of materials, connotations, and I was never taught that depiction was something that you should work toward. So I was taught that depiction was illustration, technically, um, and that there was a deeper meaning in abstraction and a deeper meaning in the combination of materials themselves, and perhaps a more profound meaning in sort of that quasi abstract space between, sort of that nebulous space in between things. So things that ride the line. So I'm irreverent toward painting as a quote unquote discipline. I'm gonna be doing this a lot. <laughs> Sorry, Tamir, but um, it, it's a tool for me. It's not my only tool, but it's a tool. My work is a, more about objects, how objects relate to architecture, how they relate to the world, um, how they relate to us and our bodies. Um, and there's always friction between those realms and the problems that painting itself presents. So I go back to painting as a surface problem and I use painting as a tool in my work, but it's not my only focus. These are paintings, this one and the previous one are from my multiple canvas series. In 2010, I started making text constructions. That's what I call them. Um, the bits of text that were barely visible in the first batch of paintings from 2008 to 2011, um, they kind of jumped out and became these um, main compositional elements in the text constructions. So I built these letter forms from wood wrap them in canvas, paint them, and attach them again to the canvas. So sometimes they're on the top, sometimes on the side. Usually it's backward text or illegible text in some way. So I wanted this real world anchor, um, something that was concrete, not too literal. Text became a way of um, utilizing a structure almost as architecture or compositional structure. Um, I also wanted to change the space between paintings. So I wanted this thing that was kind of hanging off the edge like a sign. I've never been somebody who hangs rectangles or squares on the wall and then just walks away. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I just don't do it. Um, these paintings were made with atmospheric layers of airbrush, sort of like smoky shadows um, built up slowly or kind of like scuffs on dirty windows or as if you cleaned a mirror and it left the residual of the hand. I masked out the tape or the text rather with tape and I kind of created my own blocky sort of backwards font along the way. These are big, they're like between eight and 14 feet and they're installed right to the floor, floor line. Um, there's a quote by Frank Stella that I love, where he said, no art is any good unless you can feel how it's put together. And I've always aligned myself with that. Um, I like work, I'm drawn to work that shows evidence of the artist's hand. I always try to maintain some semblance of the handmade, even when I um, use fabricated elements in my work. In these paintings, rather than cutting the word from a single piece of plywood, like with the jigsaw, I like wrote each piece out line by line, as you can see on the back in the image on the left. That's not the same painting, um, but you can see how they're made, how they're really kind of rough, how they're made piece by piece. Each piece of wood had a custom miter. So as I was building them, I would have to change things structurally. If the piece didn't have, it wasn't um, like structurally sound, I might make like a P into an R, like add that leg to hold that piece in place. And by the time I would finish, even if I started with a, a recognizable word, it would be illegible by the end. So I love this way of kind of building into the process and a way of abstracting that felt um, sort of subconscious almost. The text instructions morphed into over a few years into the three stripes. Um, these have custom three-dimensional molding 
um, that I build all, it's all handmade. Um, sometimes it's a frame, sometimes it's a portion of a frame, sometimes it's a, a extension of text. This is a piece that I made um, in 2012 in referencing an Alvar Alto building in Finland, the Turin Sanomat building. This entire series was inspired by functionalist architecture, which often um, incorporated like freestanding signs that would jut off the end of very plain facades, or almost brutalist facades. So the words on the canvas are right reading, but then the text piece on the top is backward. So I wanted to force the viewer to read from both sides. So as if the painting was being like either unfolding or being reflected in a mirror. I use all types of stencils in my work. I tend to not talk about technique. So I try to put in one slide where I can really focus on what tools I use. Cause I think sometimes it's not apparent. Um, I use airbrush and I use all different kinds of stencils, everything from tape to masking fluid um, to vinyl cutouts. I do have a vinyl cutter that I use a lot, but I like to cut things by hand because you get a little wobble and also because you're not tempted to reuse them. So I like a one use tape stencil that then I can crumple up and throw away and that you never see that thing pop up in other paintings. I pretty much use stencils from the beginning, comes out of my textile background, surface design background. It's very DIY. You can decide on something, execute it within minutes and have it on the canvas. And I love that very quick, direct application. Around 2012 or 2013, like I'm skipping, I'm, I'm like skipping entire, not bodies of work, but I'm showing you like one image from what could be a body of at least 15, maybe 20 paintings for each one. Some are smaller. This particular one, Photo Builds, is a smaller series. These are giant um, and they were extremely expensive to produce. I didn't make that many of them. They took a long time. I think there are about maybe 10 of these that exist. Um, but I wanted to incorporate photography. I didn't feel like text alone was enough of an outside world reference. I wanted there to be something um, even more concrete, something that was even more of a, um, a juxtaposition to painting. So um, I started taking photographs and having them UV printed onto vinyl and stretched over awning frames. And I had these made in Chinatown where I live in New York and just the way like a deli sign would be made. So this actually is a deli sign. It's been manipulated in Photoshop and then reprinted and it wraps around the painting. So it's, the whole thing is three dimensional. Obviously the canvases are flat. There's like a two inch or one and a half inch space between the, the surface of the canvas and the back of this um, unit. I call these paintings photo builds. Um, each photo build has one or two or maybe more painted canvases. Usually you can't see the seams if there is one. Sometimes there's a, a, um, two canvases that abut each other behind the sign. Um, and a, this three-dimensional structure that supports either the photograph or the drawing or whatever it is. This is from the second batch that I made for a show in Brussels in 2013. I changed the ratio of the canvas in an effort to, I was trying to capture the speed of Chinatown streets. So the slowness of um, people's lives as recorded in buildings, doors and windows, the street grid that never changes, and then the speed of signage and accidental marks that appear in places, graffiti, um, Robert Rauschenberg, there's a Rauschenberg quote that I love. Um, he said, New York is not a melting pot at all. Everything sticks out like a sore thumb. When I really started to look around in Chinatown, I realized how cacophonous it was um, visually, but how much it made sense, how everything just kind of fits together. So you'll see something, kind of just a glimpse of something as you're speeding by on the subway. And that glimpse is almost as profound as, you know, standing in front of the Empire State Building. So I was trying to somehow combine that into paintings. I don't know if I did it or not, but I, that's what I was trying to do. Um, by 2016, I was still working with the same ratio, the kind of thin band, um, but I'd moved into a more digital application. So this is um, a show that I had at Eric Firestone in New York. Um, 
where I printed out these or had these gradients printed onto vinyl. And those became just almost like a neon sign kind of cutting through an overcast sky. I've also um, made works that in which digital images or um, UV printed images hang freely next to canvases. In this case, the canvas is leaning against the wall and the vinyl print or the UV print on vinyl is hanging exactly aligning with it, but just hanging by the top edge and freely to the floor. Um, I was interested in how photographs could or maybe record um, more of a, uh, I don't know, they have sort of a historical weight. It's a more didactic medium. Um, and then abstract painting is sort of this human space, maybe a headspace or a psychological space in which either the action of the field of play could happen, as I mentioned before, or maybe the headspace of the athletes, but sort of the messy human part that can't be described or captured through photography. This is a found image off the internet. It's a classic rivalry, a Scott, two Scottish football teams in the 60s. If you search for, um, if you ever search for images of athletes, like historically, it's getting better, but you'll find that there are far less images of women. So as I started looking for images that I wanted to use, and I would look for like Derek Jeter's last game, Yankee, as a Yankee, I could find like 5 million images. But if you look for Brandi Chastain ripping off her um, jersey um, when she won the World Cup in 1999, there's like two views. So I started thinking that I needed to somehow fold that into the work, that discrepancy needed to become part of it, that this dearth of images existed. So I wanted to put like, how could I put more positive images of women into the world while also pushing the medium of painting further. So in this piece, the image was inkjet printed directly onto the canvas, hung against a blank canvas, and then the whole thing was painted as one. So you're left to like the, the photograph and abs the abstract painting are kind of left to battle it out visually, um, which I kind of found interesting and um, in different paintings, I've resolved that in different ways. The subject of this painting is Sarah Takanashi. She's a, a young Japanese ski champion. This is from a show in 2015 in Paris titled Skiing. I also changed the plane of the floor a lot, um, usually with carpet. Anytime you hang your paintings this low, you end up changing the floor because all of a sudden it's impacted and becomes another plane that you have introduced to the story. The portrait series became the next natural step. Um, in terms of images of women and wanting to push that forward. So I decided to focus solely on women in moments of triumph. Um, it's nothing more. That's all I wanted to do is put those images into the world. Obviously this is Serena Williams. And it's from um, the US Open, I think in 2015. So these combine um, found photos with, again, with abstract canvases, a way to kind of talk about public versus private space um, obviously I don't know Serena, I don't know what her private space is like or what, you know, she thinks about, but we have this image of, of athletes and, and celebrities as they're given to us via photography. So the medium was kind of the message with this painting or this series rather. Um, I also started cutting out shapes from black dye bond. That's the material typically that, um, photographs are mounted to. It has a very, has one shiny side and a matte side, and it can be CNC routed into any shape. And it kind of either is reflective, semi-reflective, or it can really grab light. And I just loved kind of drawing out um, the depth of the photograph via these solid black emojis. Um, I've since expanded them to include um, suspended works and wall works that are all in additions of three. These are the only things that I do that are additioned. I never used to be an addition person. I always thought like, ah, additions, it's weird. Everything should be original. But I've since like come around on that and I still keep it really small. So everyone is just an addition of three um, and some uh, mount directly to the wall on a cleat so they float and others are really large and hang in real space. 
Um, these are ubiquitous symbols, for, obviously from your weather apps, from Lisa Frank stickers in the 1980s. Um, they're the symbols that we see every day, Instagram filters. Um, to me, they're stand-ins for emotional states and a way of kind of pointing to that, that ubiquitousness and recognizability while also playing with the dystopian side of um, symbology and optimism. I've used them as punctuation in several of my shows. This was Racetrack Playa, which was named after um, a lake bed in Death Valley National Park. The show was about manifest destiny. It was about labor and the working class. Um, it was about our fragile national parks. It was right after I made this work when government shutdown was happening and people were driving ATVs through. There, there were just tire tracks that humans were making that are gonna take like millions of years to dissipate or at least hundreds. And I also was kind of approaching this formally through the male dominated canon of art history. So there's kind of a lot going on here. Jackson Pollock strips, um, Rauschenberg's gestural brush strokes, um, and of course, James Rosenquist's mashups of 60s and 70s American pop culture. So um, the largest painting in the show is um, inspired by and a kind of a play on and a twist on James Rosenquist's F-111, his famous painting that was made during the Vietnam War that has, you know, the Franco-American spaghetti in which I've substituted wires and hoses from an engine compartment on a 60s hot rod. Um, my tire tread panel is a literal nod to his tire tread panel, although mine is from the, um, the lake bed itself, racetrack playa. Um, and then he used a fuselage from an airplane and I used a photo of Joshua Tree after all the damage happened during the shutdown. So I, I wanted to make war paintings. I was like, what, why isn't anybody making war paintings? They, I need to make something that speaks about this moment in which like if, if Rosenquist paintings were about America ruining everything, then these paintings are about men ruining everything. I also started concurrently the Gene series. Um, these are also dealing with themes of Americana. Um, genes, it's like the most quintessential American invention goes back to the gold rush. It's synonymous with durability and masculinity, manual labor. I upcycle um, pre-worn genes, I cut them I flatten them out into formal elements, um, almost into brush strokes. I can use them directionally. It's a way of taking the air out of the subject matter, like literally taking the body out of the jeans, the, taking the volume out of the gas station products that I put in the back pockets. Um, so I kind of make the paintings wear their content. Like in this case, it's a UV print of a pack of camels, but it's flat. Um, it's printed on plexiglass, so it can slide right back into the pocket. So I like this idea of the paintings being able to literally wear their content, the way that we broadcast our product affiliations by what we carry around, whether we drink, you know, Gatorade or La Croix or whatever. I'm sorry, La Croix. Um, so I expanded this general theme with the denim into a large scale installation for the VIP lounge at Untitled in Miami in 2019. This was sort of like a rec room meets auto body shop. Um, it's kind of like a denim explosion. Um, it needed to be a functional lounge and I was already making denim furniture, but I also wanted it to speak to the moment. Um, so I titled the whole thing Free Beer Tomorrow. So it's sort of about like um, the empty promise of the American dream, whatever that is. Um, it's also about just, oh, what you want always being put off. Um, like the future is female, for example. Like, oh, okay, so we're supposed to wait for the future now. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can get this one to play. Yeah. So my next project was the Armory Show. Um, and this opened just like days before New York City lockdown, as you know. It was like March, early March, 2020. Um, 
The installation was kind of drawn out in part by the lounge in Miami. I was thinking about some of the same content. Um, but I, I, so I did incorporate wood paneling, although this time it's faux painted because I wanted it to be floor to ceiling and wood paneling only comes in eight foot lengths because nobody's ceiling in their basement is I guess higher than that. But I wanted 12 or 13 foot walls. So I hand painted all the wood paneling like faux painted it. Um, this is kind of a pop culture Americana as told through architecture and muscle cars and denim and live plants. Um, and there was also a nod to the art fair as a sort of as a place of commerce where things are hidden and things are revealed in stages to people um, as a way of sort of a um, drawing them in psychologically. So over the course of the fair, the booth could be changed to you know, the curtains could be slid over to reveal an entirely different body of work and create an entirely different mood. When the city closed, I, which was right after that, it was kind of a huge project, that armory thing. It was only a 13 by two 13 foot walls, but it was a massive amount of work and a massive amount of momentum. And I was already thinking about all the stuff I talked about, um, you know, sort of this weird Americana that we deal with, which is never the, the full story or the right story. Um, how materials play a part in that, like denim and wood paneling, how, how we read into them via nostalgia and our own experience, collective experience and individual experience. But when the city was closed, I couldn't go to my studio. And I also didn't know what to make. Like I didn't know what paintings made sense or any kind of artwork made sense. Everything seemed kind of vulgar and weird. And I was actually sort of felt mad at people who were still doing the same thing. I was like, how can you do the same thing you were doing before this? Like everything's different now. And I've come around on that, but I felt really, um, I felt like at sea, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what to make. And I didn't know what would make me I didn't know if I should be making anything or if it, it felt wrong. So I just walked around and the city became boarded up, um, not for the whole time, but for a few months. And plywood became um, this unlikely surface for messages. Like we just started communicating to each other. Like, you know, you might be one of five people on Broadway at a certain time of day um, and then there's a different, I mean, it just wasn't the traffic that we normally had. So I felt like these messages, little messages became very personal. And it's not that somebody wrote suck at Kevin on, on plywood in Manhattan. Um, when I started to make these paintings, I reverted to um, some kind of classic, maybe late seventies, early eighties um, school desk carvings and things like that. But it was the spirit of that message making and that really simple mark making um, that stuck with me from that period of kind of walking around and seeing the city like that. So when I got back in the studio, I started making these and they are not wood, they're um, acrylic on canvas. So there's no wood in them at all. They're made with an airbrush and conventional brush and stencils, very simple um, liquid frisket. Um, I showed them for the first time in May in a solo show. Um, at Denny Dimon that included this giant um, suspended mobile and a digitally printed carpet, which is the first time that I've tried um, a printed carpet, which is crazy and fun. I've made four mobiles over the last year. So these are like conglomerations, like sort of community um, conglomerations of the sculptures that I had been making that had just been hanging as single units. I wanted something that spoke about balance um, balance of emotional states, imbalance, um, something that was awkward, something that was askew, something that maybe felt wrong and right at the same time. And this is what I came up with. I also added these new, each one has LED dye bond. There's um, powder coated steel chain. It's a steel armature that holds the whole thing up, this kind of X. And then I introduced these new um, elements that are made from 
handcrafted for kind of hand molded from epoxy resin, so, resin rather. So that peace sign in the front is um, all made by hand traditionally with like a chicken wire armature underneath and um, resin, non-toxic resin, but resin that can be, you know, formed and that holds, um, holds you, you know, the, the movement of your hand. It holds all of your handprints. So basically the whole show was, I called it Mark and Phil, which obviously are two like, you know, just really basic vanilla um, men's names. But I was thinking about Mark and Phil, F-I-L-L, -L, as being two just very basic modes of image making. So the whole show was about, was like, I was here or we were here. So that's, that was my lockdown um, headspace. Other things that I've been up to recently, um, I revisited the curtains for a show in Detroit a few months ago, um, using it as a really dramatic framing device for a corner rainbow painting. These are two from a series that's similar to portraits, except obviously there's no people in them. Um, in this case, stacks of tires, which was a nod to the Detroit automotive industry. Um, one of my jofas, my jean sofas, and a portrait of Billie Jean King um, from 2019 traveled to Germany for a three-person show, um, also a couple months ago in Dusseldorf, where they were installed, um, and each person kind of got their own room. So it was kind of awesome to have just these two pieces installed as an installation with this bright orange carpet. It was a show about, um, art and feminism. So Billie Jean was a good subject. Um, the show at the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center is actually a painting show called Expedition. It's all about like westward expansion. Um, and Vermont kind of played a role in that because this, um, this was an old train station. So people would have come through here as they were traveling west. Um, I contributed a reworked version of my um, planter piece, which is um, kind of a split um, units, two seating units that fit around a wood paneled um, planter that holds live plants. And this dystopian sort of grumpy rainbow, double rainbow that hangs above and is sort of like a watering source, a water source. And then yellow carpet and yellow vinyl that drips down the stairs. So a nod to painting, but um, I'm the only person that put sculpture or installation in the show. And that's up till September if anyone has a chance to get over there. Brattleboro is kind of fun. Um, and the big show that I did this summer is um, my solo museum show. It's my first solo museum show. It happens to be in Germany. Um, it's called Low Pressure, which is also the name of um, one of the first hanging cloud sculptures that I made. The show combines works from my three stripes, multiple canvas series, as well as dive on sculptures. They had this funky little alcove that just sort of is there. And I, well, you'll see. I, I'm bringing part of this other room. There's two galleries and I decided to bring part of the pink installation into the other room via that little alcove. There's an immersive installation in the second room with the Jofa, suspended works, and pieces from the Jean series. So this is more a, a nod to some of my more recent work. Um, on the adjacent wall that you, or on the facing wall that you can't see, there's a corner rainbow painting that has automotive in, imagery in it. And there are two um, die bond hearts on either side. So I, I try, what I tried to do with this show and which I really, I'd never done a museum show, a solo museum show before. So um, it's not, it's not like, um, it's not a retrospective. It's not like all of my work from the last 10 years, but it, some of the work is over a decade um, old, like those three stripes. So I needed to figure out a way to draw out the formal threads in my work, what I kind of discussed at the beginning. Um, so that viewers could sort of see the progression and understand how I got from the three stripes, which kind of turned into the rainbows at some point. Um, so I, 
attempted to and hopefully succeeded in drawing out those um, visual connections and as a way of highlighting how I move through form and content without making really linear connections. So it was fun to have the opportunity to work on all those varied projects that I showed you, which all happened within the last few months, and then culminate it with this solo show in Germany where the challenge was to bring a lot of, um, a lot of work together in a meaningful way and hopefully come away feeling like excited about works that I hadn't seen in a decade. So that is my last image and um, brings us up to date as of a few weeks ago. And I'm happy to answer any questions or anything. That was awesome. Cool, thanks. Thank, thank you so much for that. Yeah. I'm gonna to try to get the gallery view too. Oh, it's, everyone's got their videos off. It's just you and me. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was really great. Thank you for that. Um, I didn't get any uh, questions in the chat yet, but. I will start off the questions by asking a question or two, and then anyone can jump in. How about that? Um, let's see. Uh, man, first of all, congratulations. I didn't realize that the museum show was your first solo museum show. So congratulations on that. That's a big deal. Um, and I, how do you feel about it? <laughs> That's my first question. Um, I feel great about it. Actually, it was a really, really great experience. It's a very, like Germany has this wonderful system of, um, which you may know about where they, you know, there's all these kind of provincial small museums that are really heavily supported by both um, the, the state and also locals. Yeah. So um, it's just such a vibrant place to do a show, even at a small museum. Yeah, so, well, it was really fun and people were really into it. And a lot of artists came from Cologne and from Dusseldorf, which is, are both pretty like within an hour. And um, yeah, I didn't know how I would feel about it. It got postponed. It was supposed to be over a year ago okay. and it got postponed because of COVID. And when things get postponed, you sort of like, I don't know, it, it feel you get stuck, you know? And I, I didn't know if it would be fun anymore, if it would feel like a chore. Right, and it it was it was great. I can't I can't say enough great things about the people that I worked with. They were wonderful. That's amazing. Well, that's such a good. That's I'm glad to hear that because I, I do completely agree with that. That if something gets canceled or postponed, it kind of changes it, even if it's just how you feel about it. And yeah, know, yeah. No, that's great. That's great. Thanks. Um, I, I do have a question for you, and it goes back to kind of what something you said in the beginning, and I'm I'm fascinated with this, um, how you took like an eight year hiatus, you know, uh, from, you know, undergrad to grad or from painting, maybe just for eight year hiatus in painting. And I think you used the term um, adulterated. So you kind of <laughs> went, went into painting with your version of what painting is, as opposed to being taught what painting is and then maybe going to grad school and I know grad school, they don't teach you how to paint and that's not what it's for. They talk to you about, well, bullshit, but you know, they talk to you about what you're doing with your work as if you've already been doing that for years. So right. I'm wondering if, I mean, it seems like that's really affected the way that you work almost like, you know, it's not traditional painting. A lot of it you've taught yourself and you've held on to it. Um, do you, did you feel, so my question, exactly what was said in the beginning where I'm talking and talking and then there's a hidden question <laughs> there, not meant You're to do that, <laughs> but um, did you feel like you had to kind of fight against that or do you feel like that kind of gave you something that other people didn't have in your making? Because you were making something that maybe nobody else was making something quite like that, you know? I, I felt more like I had to fight with faculty about that mm. um, and I had to fight for the way I spoke about art, about painting. Right. And, and for the things that I cared about and didn't care about. Like I never cared about having the right sable brush or like, <laughs> like I just didn't care about all that stuff. I would, I, you know, I was after, I didn't have any money after undergrad. I made paintings out of house paint with like whatever I could find. So I feel, yeah, I did. I had to fight a little bit, and yeah. but I also learned a lot. And I think I, I went in maybe with um, thinking that I wasn't gonna get as much out of it as I did. And then at some point I submitted to it and I was just kind of blown away by, I had really kind of 
you know, I, I studied with Tom Laskowski, who's a, um, no longer with us, amazing abstract painter, um, huge painter in New York. I don't, I don't know if it, his, um, if he reaches everywhere, if everyone's heard of him, but um, when he came to my studio and told me that every brushstroke was a memory, I was like, come on, that's, for no. <laughs> and, and then I sort of started the, to realize that this world that painters lived in, um, it was kind of amazing. It had constructed for themselves. And I didn't want to be in that world, but I could, I started to understand it. And I started to um, kind of understand the, the draw to um, thinking about it that way. And yeah, it ended up being great. And that, but I do think that my kind of weird cobbled together background and the time I took off and the life experience that happened, experiences that happened in between, like jobs I had, um, creative jobs and whatnot really made me um, a different kind of artist and have a different approach. So I'm a real champion for, um, you know, doing, not following the track. Yeah. Because sometimes, now it's really hard not to follow the track because like you can go on YouTube and it says like 10 steps to get famous as an artist and you just follow them. Yeah. Um, I know it's not true, I'm exaggerating, but. <laughs> I think that that's like what people do or they go on Instagram and they can like drill down and find out like who's selling where the auction prices and who's buying this and all this stuff. But you sort of just have to mess around and make mistakes and um, do your thing and be who you are. And that's, I don't know. I, I feel like once I did that and didn't try to be something I wasn't, then everything came together. Totally. Yeah, I love that I can kind of see that in your work, you know, it's, um, it's not traditional in that sense. And that's still coming through. I think that's, I think that's amazing. I think that's why it's, well, that's why it's attractive to me, you know, because it's not coming from that um, uh, formula, you know. Oh, thanks. Yeah, but, I feel, well, you know, at first you feel like you're an, an outsider, not in the traditional, yeah. not in the art historical sense of the word, but you feel like you, um, you know, I thought, oh, these ideas can't possibly be profound enough to make art about. There must be some more intellectual journey that I'm supposed to be on. Right. And I realized that, um, you know, there's something profound about what Matt, the most profound thing you can do is what matters to you, or what you're genuinely interested in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, you know, school will beat that out of you. And if you think that you should be something else. And um, so I'm, I'm glad I took the time and I'm glad I had the, the journey that I had, which was a little bit, you know, all over the place, but right. it worked. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, I'm just gonna wait a minute and see if anyone wants to jump in with a question. You can unmute or you can write it in the chat. You'll never get a chance to talk to Wendy White ever again. This is the I'm only time ever. <laughs> What's up? I'm completely inaccessible. <laughs> yeah, completely inaccessible, exactly, exactly. No, I understand. I mean, maybe I just explained everything so clearly. That's it. <laughs> People are also very shy, I've noticed. Um, you know, I can just keep asking questions though. I'm just gonna ask another one, how about that? Um, <laughs> uh, another thing that you said that I really loved was uh, that you see painting as a surface problem. Mm -hmm. And um, and also how, well, maybe not in the image we're looking at, but how a lot of your paintings, at least at one point in time, were also on the floor and on the wall. So it was that, you know, painting, sculpture, object, it, architecture, all of those things combined. But could you talk a little more about that, painting as a surface problem? I like yeah, that. I think, I think that it never quite made, like, this idea of painting, like, traditionally is supposed to be like this, illusionistic space, you know, like a window. Um, that never appealed to me. I never subscribed to that. Um, maybe because I don't subscribe to depiction or straight depiction. Although I, you know, obviously I contradict myself by using photographs and things like that. Um, but to me, painting was always the weird, um, just uncharted territory. Like the, the thing that I couldn't ever 
get my head around. Mm. Um, and you always feel like you're not doing it right or not using it right. And it's exciting for that reason. Um, so yeah, there's something about the support. Like, you know, I'm always asked like, why don't you just, why didn't you paint directly on the wall? Why did you do multiple canvases? Well, because there's something about the tension of the frame um, that you can have something expansive, but it still has a limit. And things with no limits just become uninteresting. So you want to have some kind of parameter, even if that parameter is like completely crazy and out there. Um, it's about, it's not about rules, but some kind of visual parameter that reminds you of, of something that, something else that exists. I think that's where the real power of objects and um, painting lies is when it kind of verges on some other territory that's not about art, but it's just about the world, whether it's, you know, I don't know, furniture or architecture um, or something that's not designed at all that just happens like Monument Valley. So yeah, I don't know. I'm Painting has always been like that super weird, tense problem for me. Mm -hmm. it keeps me coming back. Yeah. And I, I talk smack about it all the time, but I still love it. I can't, that's, that's it. Yeah, you can't walk away from it. I can't. Yeah. Do you ever do, uh, and I'm sorry if I don't know this, but do you ever dabble in or work in video? Um, no, I have not. Um, Just why do you have it? It, it has a sense to me that maybe hmm. would be doing that too, but I don't know. I've thought about it, but I'm not a big process person. Like I'm very direct with processes. So mm -hmm. things like printmaking or things that, in, that involve um, equipment that I have to procure Oh, yeah. um, or, th or like some kind of thing that I have to pre-plan. I'm really weird about. Yeah. I, sh I shouldn't be, but I'm just totally admitting that that's my personality. That if I have to say like, oh, I need other people to help me do that. Mm -hmm. Or I need a truck to get that. I'm like, Ugh. yeah, no, mm -hmm. that makes sense. I think you have to listen to the way that you work, you know, yeah. but never say never. I mean, I, I'm always open, um, but it's something that I've never tried. Just curious. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in the future. Well, okay. This is the last moment. <laughs> oh, wait, there's a question here. We've got one. Um, this person says, and I know who this person is. Hello, David. Uh, I'm curious about the trials and tribulations of your process. Some of the hurdles you faced. Your work comes off with a controlled, finished aura and I'm wondering where the struggles have been either conceptually or in construction. Mm. Um, I would say the struggles are more conceptually mm. for me. Um, yeah, I think um, like when I started to make, um, use fabric, things that I had to have fabricated like the dye bonds, I wanted those elements to be in the work, but I struggled with whether they were too um, manufactured and how to balance that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I found ways to visually balance that, but conceptually that was a hurdle for me. Um, I keep changing my work and letting things in because you get good at things and it gets boring. Mm -hmm. And I think we learn how to resolve our work. And once we know how to resolve it, that's why I don't know how people make the, like the same painting for like 30 years and just like decide to make the stripe red one day. I'm like, I would go crazy. So I constantly bring in new things and let new things in. And I try things very publicly. So, you yeah. know, when they fail, I fail in public and um, I'm, I'm kind of at peace with that. I have, I like, I like that. That excites me I, to, to that vulnerability of putting something out there and starting a conversation and showing people that you don't, you know, you don't do everything right all the time or that you're kind of weird and you have weird ideas about the world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say um, I keep trying to throw a wrench in my process and not solve things the same way. And I think the way to, to not do that is to keep changing the work. Mm -hmm. That makes sense by adding new materials, thinking of new ideas, folding things into the process. Um, and then, you know, I want my retrospective to look like polkas, 
or something. Yeah. There's just room after room where you're like, what? And then he did that? <laughs> and then he did that? Like two years later? Yeah. You know, not like where you're walking through and you're like, okay, there's a bigger, slightly bigger one. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. Somebody told me once they were like, um, get as weird as you possibly can with your work, like crazy weird. And then just reel it back in a little bit. And I'm yeah. like, how do you do that? I'm like, I don't know. But that's what you do. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I got it. <laughs> yeah, that's totally true. Do, yeah. do the weirdest thing you can think of. Actually, always do the, do the thing that people tell you not to do. Because usually the thing that people, if they come into your studio and they say, yeah, I don't know, that's not really working for me. That's usually the thing that's the most unique because mm. people want to see things that they've seen before. It's why like you see millions of painters copying Matisse still. It's mm -hmm. like, oh my God, Picasso. It's like, can we stop? Can we quit these guys? Yeah. But we'll never quit them because mm -hmm. people feel comfortable with these tried and true canonized um, ways of making. and. Uh, I think it's our, I personally think, well, I know I'm not going to begrudge anybody their like Matisse vibes, mm -hmm. but I think that our job as artists is to make something that no one's seen before. And if we can do that, we've succeeded. And I don't know if I've ever done it, but that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> here, here. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Cool. That gave me chills. So that's the right answer. Wow. All right. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. Well, thank you so much, Wendy White. It was a pleasure to have you this evening. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, and we will have you here in person again. Um, I will just great. keep bugging you. And, um, but thanks for doing it virtually this time around. You bet. It was great. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for being here. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a fabulous evening. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>